caused us, then he would be a cause. Well, hello once again, and welcome to Carrier of His Presence broadcast. My name is Elder Jesse Darrow, and I will be your host today. For the last three weeks, I've been talking to you about a book that I read that I was so inspired. I thought that it would be something to discuss for black history, but my schedule was uh, so crowded that I could not have the teaching ready for February. And as I thought about it, I said, to be able to speak to a people about their greatness, to be able to speak to a people about the love that God has for us, we don't have to confine it to a particular month. And so uh, in spite of the fact that this is not February, nonetheless, I still wanted to share some excerpts from the book that um, Torre wrote on Who's Afraid of Post-Blackness. And Torrey's definition is not for us to disavow the hatred that we've experienced in our history. So he, when he's making the term post-blackness, he said, no, no I, I, you know, all these, all the, the hatred and the Jim Crow laws, the segregation and et cetera and et cetera that we have experienced, it, it is real. And it has left an indelible mark on our hearts and on our minds as a people. But he is saying that post-blackness is the determination to no longer wear that trauma. And he said, and not to wait for the world to be different for you to live your life in more interesting ways. He said that if we are confined, we are confined in our own head or in our own minds. So I want to share today with you two different topics and one is I would really like to share what was said in the book about using the word nigger. And then to conclude, I want to conclude this teaching with how to build more barracks. And I'll get into that further in a moment. There was a gentleman in the book named Harry Allen. And his point of view on using the word nigger is, it's a word black males use as a way of affirming mutual low status. And that was really, really um, an eye opener for me. Um, look at those around you who use the word frequently. Just look at their interactions, look at their goals, look at their overall personality because Harry Allen is saying it is affirming a mutual low status. And I can remember I did not feel comfortable with that word as I got into our history and I began to study our history many, many years ago. I vowed personally not to use the word and when appropriate, correct someone else for using the same word. What well, Torrey's conclusion about the word nigger is, he said he can see how the word nigger is an old toxic friend. You ever have someone in your life that you know is just an agitator, someone you ran with, did not mean you any good and did not mean themselves any good? That's a toxic friend. Someone that puts you down, demeans you, talk about you behind your back. That is a toxic friend, and that's how he is analogizing the N-word. He said he needs to distance himself from the word because it is an enabler. And a lot of these terms are so interesting to me that I thought the book was very well written. He said the N-word and being around those who use it, he said that the N-word is an enabler. An enabler is someone who helps us to remain dysfunctional. I thought the analogy that he used was just off the chain. The N-word is an enabler, something that is keeping us from rising up, walking in confidence, 
walking in assurance that whatever it is that we've set our hearts and minds to do, we're able to do it. But if we have someone around us of a low status and we become a part of that, then we have a mutual low status. And I think it's easier to accept the N-word, brush it off as not having much meaning. But it has a lot of meaning and it does carry a connotation along with it. So he said he needs to distance himself from the N-word. Uh, and he said it's leading him down a path that is not good. So then concluding, Tory said, I need to leave the word nigga alone and spend more time with the word that is about empowerment. Sp think about being around your friends, your associates, and you begin to tell them how wonderful they are. I mean, sincerely, I'm just conjuring up something or being deceptive. But isn't that much more empowering than using the N-word and then brushing it off as if it has no negative connotation? Think about how much more empowering it is for someone to tell someone, you've done a wonderful job. Tell someone, I appreciate you. The, the vocabulary is long and it is endless on words that we can use to empower one another. So before I begin to get into chapter 7, which is how to build more Baracks, I hope that you will take into consideration all that have been said these last three weeks and realize that we are much greater a people than what we have settled for. And that in spite of all of the scars that we carry, that, that we can heal and live a better life right here in America. So in chapter seven, uh, Torre titles chapter seven as how to build more Baracks. We know that Barack Obama came across America like a storm. Very few people were prepared for an African-American president. And many people said they did not think that they would ever see an African-American president in their time. I just felt differently. I know that there were many African-American senators. There were many African-American congressmen. Actually, I really thought uh, that um, Colin Powell, was going to be the first African-American president because of the esteem and the integrity that he carries. But I never lost uh, insight or hope of the reality that we would have an African-American president and that I would see one. But there's some things that I know that we have to learn as a people. Barack Obama could not walk around with his pants sagging, 45 tattoos, 15 earrings, talking about yo baby yo, and then expect to excel into the White House. Now anyone that wants to live that life, I'm not saying that to be demeaning. What I am saying is, is that there's so much in us as a people that we have to learn to modulate. In other words, we've got to learn how to alter our ways and our means. For an example, it is no secret to anyone who know me, I am a very direct individual. I try not to be mean-spirited or cruel, but I am very direct. Well, when my husband and I started overseeing a ministry, Obviously, I had to learn to modulate, learn different ways of saying the same thing, learn how to get a message across, uh, learning how to approach a topic without slicing and dicing or leaving someone uh, uh, wounded and bleeding. So the point that I'm getting to is how to build Barack's, Barack Obama had to have started preparing for the presidency years before he was actually 
elected. And Torre says that we need to develop a deeper sense of self-certainty. Self-certainty. In other words, there are times when I can step out on Sunday morning knowing that um, I am there to teach the people of God. And sometimes I cannot feel the presence of God. But self-certainty lets me know that what God has called me to do, that I am able to achieve it and to achieve it well. Um, one of the things that is important that Tori said is to have an inclusive style. You cannot expand your base with a limited message. So then it's like we need to include others. Some people use the term black church or white church. That's not an inclusive term. There's no such thing as a black church or, or white church. The church of God is a spirit. There may be assemblies that's predominantly African American, predominantly Asian, predominantly European, whatever, but there's no such thing as a black church, a white church. So when we uh, have an, an inclusive style, every now and then someone of another nationality comes to Dunamis. I, I'm glad. I am very happy to see them and I try as best that I can, whatever message it is that I have, to, to minister that their presence does not change the message nor make me feel uncomfortable. So if we're going to learn how to build more barracks, we're going to have to have an inclusive style. We need to learn to be comfortable with white people and with being one of the few blacks in a room. I said many, many years ago, and, 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 and this was even before I read this book, when George Bush was in the White House, there were some things I would love to have said to him, and I would have said it respectfully, and I would have said it humbly. This John Wayne and Clint Eastwood attitude that people have, it is not working. But I would feel very, very comfortable talking to a president. And let me tell you something. It's not because I'm confident in my flesh. I place no confidence in the flesh. It is because of the very spirit of God that is within me. And so there's some things that need to be said that I would feel very, very comfortable in a mixed group uh, of, of people. The way you talk, the grammar, the articulation, the diction, and specific tones suggest that you deserve to be a leader. Blacks often tease those who speak textbook English, but those are the ones who will have access to higher levels of power. Do you know, and, and it is something that I was not that aware of, uh, my husband tends to have a quiet demeanor about him. Well, I'm the teacher, and so I am much more vocal and verbal than he is. And so if we're taking care of business, we usually already have discussed uh, before we go take care of business, what we're going to do, what we're not going to do, uh, how we're going to handle what's acceptable and, not, and what is not acceptable. And so we go into any type of establishment, and I began to talk I feel very, very comfortable. I know textbook English. And so that means that I can include others and not feel any level of intimidation. And that's very important. That is a way of building a Barack Obama, another Barack. Do you know all that this guy goes through in the course of one day, when we see him, he is always uh, statuesque. He appears to be confident. There's a boldness about him and something that adds to the inviting of his presence, he adds a smile. I know as a leader, this guy don't always feel like smiling. I know as a leader, he does not always feel confident. But 
He cannot allow anyone to see him sweat. That's another way of building another Obama. If Obama succeeded at a massive task that almost everyone thought was impossible, which is becoming president of the United States, then what smaller mountains can we climb that are currently deemed impossible? Now think about that. What mountain can you climb that is necessary, that is part of your purpose, that it currently is deemed impossible. We have to get out of the box. We have to think outside the box. Are there areas where you are under capitalizing on your potential? Are there areas that you are under capitalizing on your potential? Are you laid back? Are you making life a destination or a journey? I think I mentioned that once before. When I get there, when the children become adults, when I get more money, when I get a better paying job, we make life a destination rather than a journey. And so we're undercapitalizing on our potential today. Today, you can begin looking at life differently. Today, you can begin to take the first step towards achieving goals, start achieving principles, uh, start enjoying life today. He said, and underutilizing the economical, educational, and political resources we have to attack our problems. It's hard for me to believe that someone who is just barely getting by, going to the beautician, getting nails done, playing lottery, buying beer, buy, buy, I mean, all these uh, vices, and not necessarily uh, getting hair done uh, or getting a haircut because uh, grooming is very important. Uh, but the point that I'm getting to is, it's hard for me to believe that if we just barely getting by and we involved in all of these vices that we are going to attack the problem in ways that's going to be most effective. Torre asks, are there problems we think we can't solve that we can? I oftentimes say we really don't have problems. We have a potential that is going to take us further into purpose. We seldom have problems, especially if you're led by the Spirit. You have potential, but we seldom have problems. So, but is there a problem that you think you cannot solve? Are you blaming someone else for things that you refuse to tackle? For an example, a lady called me and she was sharing with me the racist attitudes that she's experiencing on her job. Knowing her, if she says that it is racist or prejudiced or bigoted, however someone would want to define it, it's the truth. And so I immediately started encouraging her to build her self-confidence because she's going to be less likely to react to a situation if she spends more time remembering God said he's made us fearfully and he made us wonderfully, that he is with us, that he's not going to leave us, that he's not going to forsake us. So she can build up her confidence and go into her job with confidence, knowing that the Lord has her back, she don't have to kiss up to anyone. She can just be who she is, do a good job, and make sure that uh, she's covering herself very well. Somehow or another, these kind of situations tend to go away. But to go on the job fussing, raising sand, cussing people out, and that type of thing, it tends not to help a matter. 
I, I believe that's one of the reasons why it's so good for us to know who we are and to know that the Lord has our back. Moving on to the next point. It is dangerous to think your limitations are equal to what you think they are. My Lord. It is dangerous to think your limitations are equal to what you think they are. I can remember so many I can't. For an example, this very broadcast, three different people came to me and said, three different people who did not know one another said, the Lord put it on my heart to tell you that you're supposed to start a radio broadcast the Lord put it on my heart to tell you that you're supposed to start some type of broadcast. And I forgot what the other lady said, but it was the same thing. I didn't think I could do it. And then I said, well, I can, but I don't want to. The last thing that I wanted was to add more responsibility on the responsibilities that I already had. Then because looking into a camera as opposed to being uh, comfortable with the way I usually teach, which is interactive. I really prefer an interactive teaching. I like to give information and then ask a question to make sure that the listener has conceptualized what I have said. So I'm thinking, this is going to be so challenging, I don't know if I'll ever get over it. Well, I had a card with information written down on it. And um, we were preparing for a broadcast one Wednesday or Thursday. And my husband deliberately left a card in the car. And he said, you don't need it. And I'm saying, yes, I do. And he said, I think you're ready. You don't need it. And so I trusted his opinion. I did the broadcast without the card and the cue card, and I've been doing the broadcast since then without the cue cards. Uh, the, the point that I'm getting to is, it is dangerous to think your limitations are equal to what you think they are. I thought I needed the cue card, but I'm doing just as well or better without it. So we have to be careful with the limitations that we put on ourselves. Some limitations are innocent. Some is keeping us away from fulfilling purpose. But you have to find out for yourself whether or not that's real for you. If you refuse to believe you are limited, then you can succeed. If you refuse to believe that you are limited, then you can succeed. Create your own reality and don't fight the power. Be the power. Wow, don't fight the power, be the power. Empower yourself, empower those that are around you. And you'd be surprised the difference that it is going to make. Um, it is, I, I, I often think many, many times about my personal life, how the Lord have taken me in many directions that I did not want to go in. And the reason I know it was him is because I see the effectiveness of that path. I see, uh, I may encounter someone I have not seen for a while and they'll bring up something that they have learned from me. I've been a teacher for many, many, many years. And I appreciate so much that in any given situation, I don't fight the power. I become the power. With every move in any di direction that I am unfamiliar with, those are the times that I found myself to spend more time in the presence of God to hear his direction, to hear what it is that he has to say. Because if you think about it, if you're talking to the Holy Spirit on a regular purpose, there's things that he is going to say to you that you're going to say, uh-uh, Lord, not me. I'm often minded of the time 
uh, Moses took the children of Israel into the promised land or across the Red Sea. And he sent out spies to go in and spy out the land to find out what the people are like, what the terrain is like, and etc. and etc. And this is land that the Lord said he was going to give them. The spies came back. These were 12 leaders. 12 leaders came back and only two caught the vision. That is not good odds. So out of all this being said, to summarize this entire teaching, who is defining you? I encourage you to figure out who is defining you. Is it the Lord or is it someone that has a negative outlook on who you are? But be encouraged uh, because the Lord has great things for you, but you have to seek him and find out who they are, wear your blackness well, and be self-confident and self-assured that God has many great things for you. I do appreciate you tuning in again uh, to the broadcast. God bless you richly. I encourage you to contact my brother through Visionary Solutions today. And um, if you have computer issues, he will be glad to hear from you. Carol Lewis from Cadillac uh, Realty. She's a woman of integrity. If you're buying a home, selling a home, or even have a question to ask, the contact information is at the end of the broadcast. I appreciate my husband so much as well for just always being there as an encourager and as a financial supporter. May God bless you richly. May his grace uh, be with you. And until we meet next week, remember, it is up to you and it is up to me to restore the image of Christ because if you're born again, you are a carrier of God's presence. God bless you. He promised us that he would be a counselor, a mighty God and a prince of He promised us that he would be a father and would love us with a love that would not cease. I tried him and I found his promises are true. He's everything he said. The finest words I know could not begin to tell just what Jesus